the gentleman, his name is Dr. Michael Lyon. And so, Mick, why don't you come and let's give him a big hand. Yeah, great to have you here. So, uh, yeah, there's your microphone. And so it's awesome to have you in the house today. And uh, why don't we... This is actually our home church, so... Yeah, why don't you share a little bit about that? Because you live in Nanaimo, We right? live in Nanaimo, which is, of course, a, a time zone slower than here. So we wake up in the morning, and in our pajamas, we attend church here. And then we get ready for church and go to church there. Yeah, <laughs> so, so... Dave is my favorite pastor. Oh, thank you. Well, you guys are so lucky. Oh, yeah, you're so lucky. Yeah, and so um, we're going to share a little bit of how our story, and then we might get into some other stuff, because, of course, Mick, and I call him Mick or Mickey, um, but your uh, official name would be Dr. Michael Lyon. Why don't you share a little bit about what you do right now, just to give the people yeah, an so idea? Yeah, so I've been a medical doctor for about 40 years, and... Uh, and that has, uh, you know, been a, an interesting path because I went into medicine to be a teacher and a mentor. And then I realized that to be a doctor, particularly in Canada, I worked in the States, it's a little different, but in Canada, that means seeing 50 people a day and writing prescriptions all day long, more or less. That, that was kind of the hard part about it for me. So I had to kind of figure out how to return to my original roots and, and Fortunately, a few years ago, the government in BC allowed doctors to start teaching classes to patients, to doing what we call group medical visits. And with that in mind, I, I knew right away what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, and I started a program for people who are struggling in their life with really complicated illnesses, um, people with type 2 diabetes and who've really um, ended up with a lot of serious health problems. We get referrals by doctors, and now I've got about 15 doctors and 30 staff in our clinic uh, with our groups and our individual visits. We see up to 1,000 patients a day. So it's yeah. the busiest clinic of its kind in the world now. Wow. It's a busy job. And here I am, a senior citizen now, and I'm doing something busier than I've yeah, ever done. Yeah, working harder than you ever had before. Pretty well, yeah. yeah. But, you know, we go way, way back. Like, um, I think when we first met was we were in grade 6, right? Grade 6, that's right, yeah. yeah. And yeah, on the same street, we're little hoodlums together. Yeah, he was the chief hoodlum, just so you know. He's the one that we all looked up to. He I was had, in junior high, he had the longest hair in school, and and we had a we had a principal who believed that boys should only have hair that is above their collar, but he had hair that was touching his elbows, and his mom actually went to school and fought with the principal to allow boys to have long hair. There you go. She what a the, righteous cause. And so she was a hero. She was the great liberator. And yeah. yeah. But of course, that, that is fruit that does not remain. <laughs> so anyway, there are some, thi more, yeah. some things more important to fight for. So yeah. anyway. But um, so yeah, we grew up together. Uh, we went to school together, junior high, high school. And, uh, but uh, along the way, because we were hoodlums, I guess I was the head hoodlum, but uh, <laughs> something happened to you. You had yeah. an encounter with Christ. And so why don't yeah, you share? I, uh, uh, the first day of university, on my way to University of Calgary, September the 7th, 1977, I saw a Gideon Bible on my bookshelf. I'd never really met a Christian or talked to a Christian in my life. I was raised in a, in a non-believing home. But that Bible just stood out like a light on the bookshelf that day. It had sat there since I was a little kid. It was given to me in school. I took out that little Bible. I opened the last page. There was a sinner's prayer. I knew right away that's what I need. I prayed that prayer sincerely. Didn't know what I just did. I had no idea what I got, got myself into. But I put that Bible in my pocket, and I go to school. And by that time, I was quite adept at meditation. So I would sit cross-legged in my usual place uh, where I'd go at the university, and I would meditate and read Scripture and close my eyes. And, and uh, that, that's how I started my Christian walk, yeah. just me and the Bible for several months. Didn't even meet a, meet a Christian for quite a while. Yeah. And then, of course, you started to get more vocal and active, and I guess at some point you set your sights on me. Yeah. Um, now, at that time, uh, of course, I was a non-Christian. 
Uh, I was heavily into drugs. I was living with my girlfriend at the time, who, just to let you know, is not Clarice. She was not Clarice. <laughs> And um, we had an apartment in the North uh, Huntington Hills, and, um, and, and you rang me up. We hadn't seen each other for quite a while, and you rang me up. Now, just to preface it, um, I had heard through the grapevine that Mick had become a Christian. Now, back then, we called them Jesus freaks or Bible thumpers. There's a thump right there. <laughs> But, you know, it really didn't uh, um, affect me very much because, Mick, I mean, you'll admit you were always into some different sort of stuff, and I've shared some of this. I remember one time going to your house to visit you, went down into your bedroom, and there you had this great big pyramid, right? And I asked you what you were doing, and you said, I'm harnessing the power of the pyramids. And I thought... I was well, doing a double-blind study. <laughs> Is that what? Okay. And I said, well, I didn't know there was um, um, power in a pyramid, and you picked it up, and there was all this fruit under there, and, and you said, yeah, you know, there's power in the pyramid. This fruit will be preserved for 500 years. And I thought to myself, well, who's going to be around to eat it, you know? <laughs> I remember one time I was going to your house, and I was just about to knock on the door, and um, you came out of the door, and you had um, needles all up your arm. Um, and uh, I said, Mick, what are you doing? And you said, well, I'm, I've been studying acupuncture, and, um, and I found out if I put a needle here, a needle here, a needle here, a needle here, I'm going to the dentist, and if I put four needles here, then when I get there, he won't have to give me anesthetic. He can just work on me. And I just thought, do the math, man. Four <laughs> or one, you know? <laughs> So, so when I heard that Mick became a Christian, I didn't think much of it because, you know, you, you were into pyramids and acupuncture and astro travel and meditation. And, and, um, but you, 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 after you became a Christian, you set your sights on me. Well, I went away to Bible school and a lot of that, a lot of that stuff was cleared up. Yes, absolutely. With sound doctrine and studying the Word. So, yeah, when I came back and I was in university, uh, well on my way to, towards medical school, I had a project that I had to undertake for one of my psychology courses. It was a, I needed to do a research project and I wanted to study stress. And I knew a genius that I grew up with that knew something about electronics and I had a plan to make a device that is called the galvanic skin response monitor, which is the main part of a lie detector test. But it can be used to train people to sense their levels of stress and to learn to relax. So I thought, here's an opportunity to reconnect with my old friend Dave that I had kind of lost. He knew me in that time that I was into weird stuff and, and all of that, but then I had lost touch. I thought, here's a way to reconnect with my friend Dave, and I'm going to go on a, I'm going to go on a, a mission from the kingdom to rescue a soul from the kingdom of darkness. And I'm going to use this to be able to do that. And so sure enough, it was an opportunity to, to meet with Dave several times. We made the circuit board together. We bought all the components. We rigged up this circuit board. We installed everything and had a couple failed tries, but we finally had a couple of working machines. And the day that I went over, I knew I was coming to pick up the final version of the machine. I thought that might be the last chance I have to really share the gospel one last time. So I went in, fasted and prayed and went in there ready to do warfare. Yeah. Do battle. Really, I was ready to do warfare Yeah, so, for the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. And so, of course, I didn't know any of this. Um, I had um, kind of had a real interest in electronics in high school. I used to make all kinds of electronic stuff like light organs and things like that and sell them. But um, so anyway, he kind of wrote me in on this project and uh, he came. It was like you say, the last um, time to pick it up. It was now built. And uh, so I, I'll never forget when he came, drove up to the house, when he got out of the car, um, he had a Bible in his hand. And uh, the first thing I thought was, wow, you know, who does he think he is? Billy Graham, like, coming into my house with a Bible? Um, but, you know, we, we've been friends for years, so I welcomed him in. And um, we did some small talk. We looked at the machine, tested it out. It seemed to work. And then the conversation went from, um, you know, science and the machines to the Lord. You opened your Bible and you started sharing Jesus with me. 
Yeah, so I think that was the time where I knew this was it. Dave has to make a decision. I have to put him kind of on that precipice where Dave knows that if he makes the right decision, he has eternal life. If he makes the wrong decision, he's under the condemnation. Uh, and, and that's the place I didn't want to leave him. Yeah. So anyway, you were telling me about Jesus, and Jesus loves me, and Jesus has a plan for my life. Jesus died for my sins. And, you know, you're sharing scripture with me. We're in my living room. And, um, you know, the thought that was coming to me, it, it was really a, a question. Um, uh, and it was, I don't know how uh, a Jew who lived 2,000 years ago could have anything to do with me today. Now, that was an inner thought. I didn't want to ask that question because then I knew you'd preach even more, you know. Um, so that was just rolling around in my mind. And as you uh, began to share, continued to share, uh, all of a sudden this strange presence came into the room. And uh, I now know that it's the person of the Holy Spirit. At that time, I didn't know anything. I just felt this strange presence and, 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 and next thing you know, I looked over at you. I was on the couch. You were uh, sitting on the armchair. And your whole face was glowing. You couldn't see your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. Now, at that time, the thought that came to me, and this is the thought that changed my life, um, was I don't know, I don't understand what this man is saying, but one thing I do know is it's true. Now, of course, you didn't know any of this was going on inside of me, right? No. Yeah. No. So, you know, the, the thing that, that we all have, always have to remember, we, we do warfare in the unseen realm. And when it's people, you can never judge who is one of God's chosen ones, who he is going to call to be his own. You have to just go with that sense that that's why I'm called here is to is to bring this one into the kingdom. Even if it seems unlikely or there's resistance or they're arguing or they're even quite antagonistic, you've got to hang in there and trust in the Lord. And it's really the Lord that has to do the work. No yeah. one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. Yeah. yeah, and so, of course, you didn't know what was going on inside of me, and I wasn't saying very much. Um, I was looking over at your glowing face. Uh, but, you know, just about as quick as you came, I mean, you took the, 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 the device that we had made and you said, well, Dave, I got to go. And so you closed your Bible. Uh, I uh, took you to the front door and you went in your car, drove away. Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing is after I closed the door, I went up into the living room again where we had been. And although you had left, that same presence was there. And uh, I sat down in the couch and, it, and the only way I can describe it is it's like every sin I had ever committed was right at the surface of my life. Every, you know, and now I, I, I realize what that was. That's the Holy Spirit. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He'll convict the world of sin. And I was getting convicted. Uh, I didn't understand it at the time. All I know is I was sitting there. I was very, very uncomfortable. So much so that I couldn't sit there anymore. And so I got up, went downstairs to my bedroom. And as soon as I opened the door of my bedroom and walked in, the power of God, no lie, the power of God hit me. I, I, I fell down on my knees. I started to cry out to Jesus. I, I prayed what at that time I didn't know what it was. Now I know it to be the sinner's prayer. Um, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, cleanse me. You know, even in that prayer, I prayed, um, Lord, I want to be part of your army. And I didn't even know that God had an army. Um, that's called the gift of repentance. And, um, and so that was a defining moment for me. Uh, but it didn't end there because I think that was like a Monday night. And one thing you had said to me uh, before you left is, Dave, we have this fantastic youth meeting you need to come to on Wednesday night. Will you, will you do that? And, 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 and I said I would. Now, of course, you didn't know any of this had happened. You had gone. I had been, had an encounter with Christ. Um, and, and, and that was on a Monday night. The youth thing was on a Wednesday night. Well, all that time in between, Monday 
to Wednesday, there was all this warfare. You know the parable of the sower? The seed is planted, and, and the, the, the birds will come and try and steal it. And I had this voice in my head saying, what did you do last night? You know, kneeling down, are you crazy? And it said things like, you were having an LSD flashback. It actually said that, you know, a, a bad dr drug experience. And, and by the time Wednesday had rolled around, Wednesday morning, it had pr pretty well talked me out of the encounter I had with Christ. And, um, and I said to myself, you know, if I'm not going to that meeting, um, and if Mick doesn't phone me, it's done. And I, I was almost hoping that you wouldn't. Um, but sure enough, I got home from work that night, and um, the phone rang, and it was you. And uh, you said, Dave, well, we going to the meeting? And, um, you know, that goes to show you the importance of follow-up. You know, just continuing to pray, continuing to connect, and um, believing, you know, that, that, that God is going to bring, bring this fruit into fruition. So, of course, because I promised I would go, I said, yeah, we'll be there. And we, it was my girlfriend. I said, you know, um, we're going to, uh, we got something. I said, I got something real special tonight. She said, what? I said, oh, we're, we're going to go to a meeting. What kind of meeting? She said, I said, oh, it's a church meeting. A church meeting? I said, yeah, but it's all young people. So, you know, at that time, um, this youth meeting was called uh, Youth Explosion. It was put on by the church that you were attending. Can you imagine Youth Explosion? It had grown so much that they were meeting in a cabaret room in a hotel. They weren't meeting in the church. Uh, so I thought that was kind of different. I told my girlfriend, now we're just going to this cabaret youth meeting church thing. And we showed up. And, um, you know, I'd never been to a service before, and people were singing just like we had sung here, and, and I thought it was a little different. And then the gentleman who was playing the piano, he had, like, Coke bottle glasses, really. Um, he jumped up, grabbed the mic. I, I, I came to find out he was the youth pastor. Um, and he, he, uh, he started preaching like there was no tomorrow. The only way I can describe it is he was like a, a, a black man trapped in a little white man's body. He, pre he was a preaching machine. He preached like T.D. Jakes. Of course, I didn't know T.D. Jakes back then, but he wasn't even, I don't know. Anyway, the, the sermon was so impacting when he gave the altar call, my girlfriend and I came to the front. And that was when I publicly declared my commitment to Christ. And that was the complete turnaround. I, I, never, I, I, I never went back on the Lord since then. It was full bore for Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, the neat thing then is you might want to explain what did you, you, you started discipling well, me. Back then, things were happening so fast. I mean, so many people were coming to the Lord in, in our group of young people. It was a real time of revival. And, uh, and so we had to, you know, the, the resources were pretty thin. So when Dave came to the Lord, there was a need for a baptism. And we had a baptism service, baptized Dave in my parents' swimming pool. That's right. Out in Bearspaw. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, uh, we, we gathered around a campfire in 12 Mile Coulee where it was just a coulee, not a subdivision. We walked down to the, into the coulee and built a campfire. And then I laid hands on Dave and prayed that he'd receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So it all happened very quickly. It really did. Yeah. And that was the tail end of the Jesus movement. If you've ever seen the movie The Jesus Revolution, we were at the tail end of that. God was doing some wonderful things. And... Um, yeah, and then, of course, we kind of lost touch with each other. Maybe you want to share, because uh, yeah, you left, left town, right? Yeah, I left town. Um, left town with my girlfriend, who we got married. We got married. We, we met when she was 16 and 19 and 78. She went to university in the States for a while. When she came back, I had just about ready to graduate from medical school, so we got married and went down to the States for a few years, and I practiced down there when I came back to, to Calgary. Lo and behold, David come back from Truro and had started, he had taken over church at Varsity, the mm -hmm. Victory Church, and he became my pastor, best pastor I've ever had. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's like a big circle that's come around and 
yeah. here we are, we're, we're both senior citizens now, so it's yeah. another circle wow. that's come around. We're sitting here again today. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be serving the Lord together in wheelchairs. <laughs> yeah. But then you were here for about a year, and then you went out west. Yeah, and, um, yeah left that, for the island. Yeah. yeah, and that's when you kind of got into what you're doing now. So why don't you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, as I said, I, in my dream was to, uh, to be more of a teacher and a mentor for people rather than just write prescriptions all day. Nothing that, not that that's wrong or that there isn't a need for that, but, but my calling was really to help people turn their life around because I had a pretty rough upbringing. I, I was raised in a home where there was a lot of conflict, and, and I think I sort of escaped with my life. I as a teenager, became quite depressed and suicidal and kind of worked through that and the drugs and the alcohol and all of that and, and uh, struggled with my physical health. My mother had diabetes in her pregnancy and I was a big kid and always teased and lost weight because I almost died of pneumonia. And so, you know, to me, I really wanted to help, help people. It was almost like I, I saw that people were living in prisons and they needed someone to help them escape from prison. And so my job was to try to teach them how to rebuild their lives and to get better meta, mental and physical health. And that's kind of what we do today. It's really amazing that I can do that and the government supports it. And I can share my faith with my patients and with my staff. I have some wonderful Christian staff. I think a couple of them are probably watching right now. Hi, Karen and Susan, <laughs> if you're there. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I just... Uh, I, I'm a doctor, but I, you know, I, I really get to share my heart with people, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing that I think has uh, made it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, and so you deal with um, uh, uh, people who, you know, like you say, are, 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 are in prison. Um, some are uh, a lot of people who are addicted to food and who are wrestling with obesity. That's one of your major focuses. Yeah, um, I mean, severe problems where yeah. they're referred by their doctor. We only accept people that are referred by physicians, so people who are really in trouble, probably whose lives are going to be very short if they don't come and work with us. So it's a pretty serious matter, and people come very broken and feeling very um, disempowered, demoralized. They've tried and tried and tried to get things sorted out, and they can't do it. So yeah. it's not an easy job, and it doesn't work for everyone, but for some, you just really do see people liberated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and of course you deal with a lot of people dealing with uh, anxiety and, and stress yeah. and those kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, anxiety is probably at the top. Yeah. It's the plague of our society now. It's, it, it's really, I think, the, the biggest thing that we are all coping with. And yeah. we know, that, you know, as the days draw near, he said that men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. Those yeah. days are... They're coming. If they're not here already, I mean, we just see the the instability in the world in so many ways. And yeah, so many people struggling in yeah. this area. Yeah. So not falling into fear. It's a really, really important thing for us as believers to learn to be people of courage. Yeah. So maybe one thing, like, and we don't have a lot of time, but maybe one thing we could just sort of focus on uh, today is, you know, as as. As, as Christians, as non-Christians, I mean, what are some things you, you, you um, would do, uh, you would advise, just some keys to, yeah. to better mental health, sure. dealing with sure. anxiety and stress? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think everyone knows this scripture, right, from, mm -hmm. from Philippians, to be anxious for nothing. I mean, stop and ponder, be anxious for nothing. What a liberating gift but it also is coming in the form of a command, right? It's a command. Be anxious for nothing. What, what a liberating command. To be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication right. with thanksgiving to let your requests be made known to God. And then, what's the outcome? The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is our firm foundation, isn't it? Yeah. Our firm foundation, yeah. So, of course, I can't. I, actually, I, I show this scripture to people, to my patients, many of whom are not believers. Or oh, you from, show this? In oh, your yeah, practice? I show this. I say, you know, I, I'm not telling you this is something you necessarily have to do, but I'll just share with you something that's 
really close to my heart, and I'll show them this scripture. Yeah. I said, for me, you know, and this is a good principle, if I'm anxious about something, I stop and say, well, is there something I can do about it? If there is, get at it. A lot of ang our anxieties are on our to-do list, aren't they? They're mm -hmm. like things we're procrastinating. Mm -hmm. Procrastination is largely because of anxiety. It's like there's a lot of anxiety to, to getting at things, isn't there? Doing the hard things especially. Um, but those are things that create anxiety. It's really things that are on our to-do list that we don't do, that we don't courageously kind of get after. So when someone's anxious, I stop and think about it. Is there something you can do about this thing? Even in part, if there is, get at it or plan to get at it. You know, let's make a formal plan to make some changes. And if there's nothing you can do about it, I say to my patients, then I give it up to God. I said, if you want, you, I guess you give it up to the universe, but to me, I give it up to God and I let it go. And uh, I just say that and just see what, I mean, maybe that offends some people, but surprising how many comments yeah. I get, people appreciate that. And, uh, and it's a simple way I can share, I can share my faith. Um, another thing is, is being the master of your own thoughts. One of the things we teach people, I mean, this is very basic psychology. Cognitive behavioral therapy is really, it's a very wise set of principles that's based on the understanding that our thoughts are not necessarily reality. Our thoughts are there, firstly, to protect us because, you know, there is a lot of potential danger and it's important that we have a certain amount of caution and even fear because if we had no fear, I mean, that's like having no pain. That can be quite disastrous, right? Kids with no fear, well, they'll end up deciding they're going to be Red Bull stars and then they are, you know, they have a neck injury or something, right? Like, it's good to have a certain amount of fear. Mm -hmm. But I think the whole thing is to um, just to remember that thoughts are there to be examined. You know, it's not, they're not necessarily always to be believed. Often, you know, we, we think about the future, try, you know, trying to figure it out. How good are you at predicting the future? You know, give that one to God. Right? Yeah, I know. Like, for instance, I thought I'd be watering my lawn by now, but <laughs> I so, thought I could, would, would have taken a shower, but I haven't yeah. showered for a week. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. But how could we predict that we would have a major water crisis in Calgary? No yeah. one could. No. And that's how unpredictable the future is. Exactly. Yeah. But in all things, we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose. So we can always condition our thoughts to be, as Paul said, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are uh, lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the things we're to think about and to meditate about. And, and often we get ourselves caught up in anxious ruminations where we try to figure out our problems and, and go over and over the things that we're worried about or we regret. That's not a biblical way to live. We're supposed to condition our thoughts and be the ones who are really in the um, in the driver's seat when it comes to your thoughts, mm -hmm. to be have your thoughts ruled by Christ and His Word. Yeah. Right? So being very aware and conscious of what we're thinking. Yeah. I think sometimes I know I'm 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 bad for this. Sometimes I can get some some thoughts in my head, uh, anxious thoughts, thoughts of worry, mm -hmm. and I'm not even realizing that uh, they're increasing, they're intensifying, yeah. and um, before you know it, I, I have an anxious heart. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and so I guess one first step is to be, be conscious and aware of the thoughts that we're thinking yeah. and comparing them, to, I guess, to the thoughts of God. Well, examine your thoughts is important. If you're anxious, try to figure out what it is you're anxious about. Try to verbalize that, get it out, and say, well, I'm anxious about this or that. Sometimes it's like a stew. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you lose track of all the bits in the stew. So you've got to be willing to kind of go inward a bit and to figure out what it is that I'm really anxious about. And then try to examine the truthfulness of those mm -hmm. thoughts. You know, do I really have the capacity to predict the future? If I look back on the past, did God take care of me before when I was in a situation like this? Mm -hmm. In six months from now, will I really care about this thing? Probably not in most cases. If it's something about, a, you know, if it's a relational issue, you're trying to read the other person's mind, maybe. And, and we're not very good at that, are we? Mm -hmm. you know, not we're really good. not, no. 
Um, and so, and you know, making catastrophes out of small things. These are the kind of things that, that are very, very common problems that people fall into. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, we run a six-week course on managing your anxiety, and it's based on these three principles. Calm, calm down, correct your thinking, confront your fears. The three C's of anxiety recovery. I got this from a Christian psychologist from Oklahoma, so it's, you know, it's a kind of a nifty way to remember it. But if you feel anxious, first thing to do is to calm down. Maybe spend some time in prayer and meditation and worship before God. If you're not doing that every morning, like to me, if I don't start the morning with my time with God, with the time of intimacy before Him, pouring out my heart before Him, unloading all of my fears and worries, my day's not going to go very well. So I've just learned, I just have to do that. I just have to do that. I have to have that time with God where I, where I just become calm and at peace with Him. I find His peace, the peace that He gives, not the peace that the world gives. Yeah. And then that might mean, you know, that anxiety stores up in your, in your body, in your muscles. Get out and get some exercise. Yeah. You know, if, if you were meant to be sedentary, you'd start growing roots out of your bottom to prove it. We're not. We're meant to be mobile. And so, especially like me, I have to sit in front of a computer all day. I've got to really very strategically make sure I take breaks and get exercise and move and stretch. And the physical body needs that. It's just one of those things we need. So yeah. that's a way of releasing stress. Yeah. Um, go for a walk. Um, have a daily exercise routine. Yep. Yeah. Ride a bike. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And as Paul said, uh, you know, if if your if your mind is on idle it'll tend to drift into anxious rumination. Instead, be thankful. Be in worship. Sing to yourself in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing with our thought life. Um, and, you know, really learning to manage our thoughts. And then the biggest thing, I think, is to confront our fears. You know, starts with your to-do list. Like, get at those things. Do them. If you're feeling nervous, if you're feeling anxious, a lot of it is going to be things that you're procrastinating. Some of those things you might maybe going to have to go back and say, I'm sorry, I, I said yes, I'm going to have to say no. You know, maybe you're just saying too many yeses to people and you're going to have to pull back and make some boundaries. But in any case, that's, that's a pretty reasonable thing to do. And you know, courage is, I think, the bottom line for a believer is that we are to live in courage. I love this passage from Joshua where he, he said, have I not commanded you? Hmm. It's not a suggestion. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, be not afraid, neither be thou, sorry, King James, be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee where, whithersoever thou goest. Or as the New King James says, wherever you go. Mm. Right? Never forget it. It's a commandment. And he's, if you look at Joshua, I think there's three places where he said, have I not commanded you to be, of, to be, to be not afraid, to be not dismayed, to be, to be courageous, right? Right. So maybe one thing we all could do is to think about the fears that we're facing right now and um, do an do a autopsy on them or a diagnosis on them. Some of them are, are like you say, come from procrastination. Yeah. Uh, others, they just need to be confronted yeah. with the command of be yeah. courageous. And, and it's, sometimes it's just a very, it's very simple. Um, this is probably one of the most simple, mo you know, this is one of my favorite books that I have is a book called Get Out of Your Head and Into Your Life. You know, it's, a, it's a really great and important concept that most anxiety is simply our imaginations. It's our anxious ruminations where we sit, instead of meditating on the Word of God and praising Him for the things that are worthy of praise and reminding of ourselves of his great promises and who we are in him and the fact that we can always be of good courage, we end up falling into anxious rumination. And so the best thing to do oftentimes when you're feeling anxious is to, is to just be present. Whatever you're doing, just be there. Be fully present and engaged in what you're doing. Because a lot of the time we're anxious because you're watching a show and you're still worrying about things. You're ruminating about things. You're listening to some music, you're ruminating about things. Maybe you're multitasking. But try to be fully engaged in your life. Yeah. If you're anxious, 
Go do something useful. Go think of something to do that is useful. Tick off something from your to-do list. Call somebody that needs to be encouraged. Go visit a friend who mm -hmm. is on your list of Hit targets. List. <laughs> and share the love of God with Share them. the love of God, yeah, yeah with those people. Yeah. Pray. Be an intercessor. Do spiritual warfare because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself yeah. against the knowledge of God. Yeah. Bringing every thought into captivity yeah. to the knowledge of Christ. I think I botched that up a little bit. but no, I think you got her pretty good. <laughs> You know, it really speaks to me about being present because I know I can even be doing spiritual things. I can be praying. Yeah. I can be reading my Bible, and yet my mind is ruminating about worries. Yeah. yeah. Right while I'm doing good and godly things. And at that point, you know, go, you know God reminds me that I'm not even connecting with him. And, and just the ability to let that go. Sometimes it's good just to write it down, let it go so you can be present at that moment. Yeah. And I think that not only happens in our relationship with God, but our relationship with other people as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I know sometimes Clarice will be talking to me and I'll be looking at her, but my mind is somewhere else. And that's yeah. when she smacks me. No, she never <laughs> smacks me. Yeah. But that ruminating mind can be a real problem. Yeah. yeah. The, biggest, the, the biggest, I think the best thing that I ever did, the habit that I got into at the very beginning when I became a believer, is as I'm re reading through the scriptures, I come across something that I don't want to forget. I started writing them down on, on cards. I'd write the scripture down. I'd put it in my pocket. I'd carry it with me. Every time I had a chance, I'd bring it out and I would read it until it was in me, inside of me. Yeah. And I started doing that nearly 50 years ago. And now the Word of God is in me and I've got whole chapters yeah. of the Bible inside of me. And when I'm, you know, when I'm sitting around and I could easily be just sitting there anxiously ruminating, I can just regurgitate a scripture. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so there's reading the Bible, there's meditating on the Bible, which is very helpful. Of course, then there's memorizing. Memorizing, yeah. Portions of Scripture. So that, it be, so that it becomes incorporated into the fabric of your being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how the Word of God will dwell in you richly. If it actually is, it's part of your portfolio of heavenly investments, yeah. is the Word of God is now in you, stored in you. It's the most powerful thing you can have on this earth. It's the most valuable thing is the Word of God richly dwelling inside of you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to have to bring it to a close. Uh, this might be a, um, a, a wild card question. I don't know. But, um, you know, you deal with lots of people who are um, dealing with anxiety, depression. Now, we know that, um, that, that, that medication can help some. Yeah. Right? And, sure. and it really does. Yep. It's not a bad thing. H how would you weigh those things? Like, what's your opinion on that when it comes to someone who's quite anxious um, a lot of the times? Yep. Where, where would you go well, with that? I, I mean, the main thing, the mistake I think that's been made in medicine is that drugs are often used that can create dependencies. We've seen this with the management of, of pain and opioids. But the same is true for the management of anxiety. You know, for many years we used drugs called benzodiazepines, which are also drugs that create very strong dependencies, and people can become truly addicted to those drugs. They can certainly be very, very hard to come off of. So there's newer medications that we use now that are often very helpful, and we try to get people less dependent to eventually not require these medications. Our, our clinic is, is certainly not very popular with the drug companies because as time goes on, people start not needing various medications and I I think that's a great thing mm -hmm. but you know medications often a bridge it's a bridge it's to a bridge. something that's more yeah. uh, sustainable for people and sometimes medication is just required yeah so sometimes it, it, it is the answer but sometimes you're right it's just a bridge to get to to, to, to more freedom and um, the ability to, to to control and deal with your stress and anxiety yeah yeah uh, on your own yeah, I mean, we're dependent on many things. We're dependent on food and water and mm -hmm. sleep. And so some people require certain medications. I was born with a defective heart valve. I have to be on a, on a medication that keeps my heart from going too fast mm -hmm. or I could just keel right over right here. Mm -hmm. 
be a great place to keel over if I'm going to keel Guess over. So. <laughs> Guess so. If you're Pretty gonna... safe place. <laughs> Angels all around. Many yeah. to carry me up. Yeah. No, not today. Not today. Well, it's been wonderful. How many have enjoyed this? <laughs> wow. I was so, it was maybe, I don't know, maybe four months ago. I was just having one of those really bad days. I think I'd gotten over a sickness or something, and I don't know what had happened, but I, you know how you have those days where you just, you feel really down. I was just so down. I was so down I didn't want to go to church. So I laid down in bed, and then I had, oh, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just look at what's going on at Victory Church. So I opened up, Dave's just started to preach. And I sat there and listened. It's like, Dave is preaching to me. Dave is preaching to me. Pretty soon I could feel my spirit being lifted out of that pit until I, I mean, I'm, I mean, for one thing, I was thinking, you know, what good is my life? You know, isn't the accuser terrible? Yeah. He can make, he can make you feel so little, mm. so useless. And here, I, you know, I've spent a career as a doctor and think, what have I done? I've been putting Band-Aids on people. You know, what, what good is that? What, what, what is not going to be wood, hay, and stubble? I was in that state of mind. And then I started listening to this preacher that I led to the Lord and thinking, <laughs> and there's all you people out there. I'm thinking, you know what? There's been a few, there's been a few bits of gold, silver, and precious stones happen Amen. in this life. It's not so bad. I started talking back to that accuser and started saying, Christ is sufficient. Christ is good. Pretty soon, by the end of that sermon, I was just, I was like right back on the, yeah. in the stream of God again. So grateful, so thankful. Well. You, you are a very, very fortunate group of people to have this man of God to be under. Thank you. Well, it wouldn't have happened if uh, Mick hadn't taken the command of courage. Well, someone else would have. Someone else would have. To command of yeah. courage and come visit me in my apartment. I'm strung out druggy, kind of. Um, living in sin, and you came and shared Jesus with me just out of the obedience yeah. of God. And so, you know, even be thinking this week, you know, I know we're all a little bit afraid sometimes to share um, the message of Christ. But, you know, a little dose of courage to get out of the boat and be obedient to God, and the fruit can be tremendous. If you decide to do a special ops for the Lord, just know he's got your back. Mm -hmm. He's got your back. So go in there prayed up. Go in there prayed up and filled with the word, and just trust that, that you'll get out of the way when he needs to step in. That's the key. Amen. It's uh, If you're not the greatest evangelist or apologetic master, just trust in the Holy Spirit to be there. Because I've never been that person who can just somehow come out with these, you know, great sayings and things to come back for people when they argue. I'm just, I'm not very good at that. But I, I know that if I step out of the way, he's going to be there. And he was there. Yeah. He was there. It was, the, that, that, that evening changed my life forever. And I'm so thankful. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we stand? Why don't we all stand? And um, we'll have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Mick and Sandy and their family. I thank you for their obedience and their passion to follow you. And, Lord, it hasn't always been easy, and you've taken them through many roads and paths. But, Lord, you've always been faithful. And that's one thing we can all bank on here is your faithfulness. And so, Lord, we just ground ourselves in you, your character, your goodness, your mercy. Um, Father, we cast our cares upon you. Uh, we fill our hearts with gratitude and thanksgiving. Uh, Father, we choose to, uh, to root out the, the anxiety and the worry. And, Father, be bold lights, bold declarers of your word, your love. Uh, in this world that needs you more than ever. And so, Lord, empower each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the message today, and I hope that it lifted and encouraged you in some way. 
If you made a decision to follow Christ today, we would love to know about it. And the best way to do that, to let us know, is by heading over to our website at rovc.ca and clicking on the tab that says connect with us. Also, if this message was a blessing to you, we'd love it if you could get the word out by liking and subscribing or even giving to our ministry. If you're interested in making a donation, you can do so by heading again to our website and clicking on the Give tab. Again, thanks for joining us and may God richly bless you.